One of the Buddha's insights on the night of his awakening. was well, so that the universe doesn't have any purpose, doesn't have any meaning. It just goes around and around and around. As he said later, it would be very hard, very hard to find someone who hadn't been your mother in all that long, long time, your father in that long, long time, sister, brother, son, daughter. Relationships come and go. And they don't lead anywhere. Now these insights can be very alienating. Because our minds want purpose. We live based on desire. We have goals. And that's how we find meaning in life. A life without meaning is a life that no one would want to live. Well, the Buddha's realization was you have to give meaning to yourself. But if you look for meaning in relationships, that can be relationships of power, relationships of wealth, human relationships of almost any kind. They all fall apart. Either relationship turns bad, or it stays good and one side has to die. That's why I decided that only really worthwhile meaning you can give to yourself is to look for something that doesn't die, that's worth the effort that goes into it. So he offers this as a challenge. First it was a challenge to himself, he was able to fulfill it. He offers it as a challenge to everybody else now. When a deathless happiness is possible, do you want to content yourself with anything less? The problem, of course, is that he couldn't take that deathless happiness out and show it to anybody. As John Mahabhava once said, if you could actually take nirvana out and show it to people, they wouldn't want anything else. But it's something that's pachatang, as we chant. It's something that each person has to find for him or herself alone. And on top of that, there's so many people out there clamoring for your support in whatever they think is a happy life. And John Fuang talks about parents who don't like to have their children meditate. They like to content themselves with, well, they did as best as possible by having a family, finding meaning in the family. And when their children start looking for something more than that, the parents feel threatened. They try to pull the child back into looking for happiness in relationships. This comparison is someone who stepped into dog shit and then tries to get everybody else to step in dog shit. So think carefully about where you're going to find meaning in life, where you're going to find happiness. That's such an important issue that you'd think people would really be careful about where they looked for examples. But we have this tendency, so-and-so says they're happy, and we say, well, maybe they really are happy, I'm miserable. This path is taking a long, long time. Why don't I follow them? Well, look carefully at the people you take as your examples. People's mouths have no laws. They can say anything they want. You have to look at them, look at their behavior, look at where their happiness is going. To decide who you want to listen to. It's one of the reasons why Sankha Anusati is something that's really useful, especially when you're going away from the monastery. 
we're surrounded by so many people with so many different opinions, and anything goes in this land of wrong view. So it's good to keep alive in your mind the fact that there were people who were able to find happiness, true happiness, through developing qualities of their minds. Qualities like generosity, virtue, renunciation. As we're sitting here meditating right now, that's a type of renunciation. We're renouncing our fascination with sensual pleasures and looking for something that's deeper. Discernment, endurance, effort, truthfulness, determination, goodwill, equanimity. These are all good qualities to develop inside. And a life devoted to developing them is a meaningful life. It heads someplace. A life devoted to relationships just ends with death. But a life devoted to the perfections leaves you with the perfections you've developed. You carry those over the next time. You can build on them from there and build on them from there. So keep in mind the people who've lived this way. We have examples in the, in the canon, in the Terigata, Terigata, the suttas that tell us about the monks and nuns. who came from all kinds of backgrounds and had all kinds of problems in their minds, and yet they were able to work through their problems. We have the lives of the Ajans. They give us examples. This is how human beings can live. They can live deliberate lives. In other words, lives where they've thought through all the implications of what they're doing what they really want, and trim things down, pare things down, that get in the way of that object, get in the way of that purpose, that meaning. The Pali word atta means both meaning, purpose, and benefit. So what is your atta? What is your benefit? What is your purpose? What is your meaning? I've told you that story of my friend who was an author. She taught at a university, and every time she wrote a novel, she would be invited to the different alumni clubs to read from her novel. So she had to choose a, an incident in the novel that was a nice self-contained episode that you could read in about 15 minutes. In her last novel, what the episode she chose was of a The story of a young woman who's lost her mother. Her father first says he's not going to remarry, but then he does remarry. And he marries a courtesan. But the courtesan is a good woman. And one evening she's playing chess with a young girl. And as they're playing chess, she says, If you really want to be happy in life, you have to decide there's one thing you want more than anything else. And you're willing to sacrifice everything else for that one thing. The young girl's half listening, half not listening, but she begins to notice that her stepmother is a sloppy player, losing pieces here and there. And so the young girl gets more aggressive. What happens, though, is she falls into her stepmother's trap. Checkmate. The stepmother was illustrating her story by the way she played chess. She was willing to lose some pieces, but she kept one thing in mind. She wanted to win the game. Well, my friend read that to two or three alumni clubs, and she realized she had to choose another episode from the novel. Nobody liked the message. Everyone wants to keep all their pawns, keep all their pieces, and win. But life doesn't work that way. We have to make sacrifices. It's a principle in the Dharma. If you see a lesser happiness that gets in the way of a greater happiness, you have to be willing to give up the lesser happiness for the sake of the greater. The British translator of that passage wrote a footnote one time saying that this couldn't possibly be the meaning of this verse. 
It's just too simple, too basic. Who needs a Buddha to tell us that? It may be simple, it may be basic, but nobody wants to hear it. And that's why we're so miserable. True happiness requires dedication, it requ requires determination, it requires conviction, it requires circumspection. Be very careful about how you choose your models. And don't listen to just anybody. Once you've chosen a good model, see what's getting in the way. Be willing to give up the things that get in the way. Hold on to the things that are maybe difficult to do but have to be done. And try to keep your mind calm in the midst of all this. In other words, don't get excited by somebody who comes along and says, well, I found happiness with drugs, or I found happiness with relationships, or I found happiness with whatever. Your happiness is something that's too important for that kind of attitude. So take it seriously, not in a grim sense, but take it seriously. And give your life that focus that really does give it meaning. You think of the Buddha. He worked all those many, many lifetimes to become Buddha, not only for his own purpose, but also so he could teach. But there's a fascinating incident right after his awakening. He began to have second thoughts about that teaching career. This got a Brahma all upset, so the Brahma came down to invite him to teach, saying, there are people who have little dust in their eyes. They'll understand. Then the Buddha confirmed this with his knowledge, so he decided to teach. Now the commentary tries to explain this way, a way, saying that the Buddha didn't really mean that when he said he might not teach. He was just fishing for an invitation. But we have to remember, after the Buddha gained awakening, he had no debts to anybody. He taught not because he had to or because when he was unenlightened he made that vow. His teaching came out of total freedom. He could have not taught, because he didn't owe anything to anybody. And that's the kind of happiness we should all look for, a happiness where we don't owe anything to anybody. Because otherwise we're constantly in debt. This person has helped us, that person has helped us. We have to think about those debts. The people we've wronged, we have to think about those debts. But those debts are all wiped out at awakening. So think about that, the possibility of a totally debt-free happiness, a happiness that has no obligations. And then when any other forms of happiness are proposed to you, make sure your standards are high. 